I guess we should start. Okay, well, uh, welcome to the policy boff this year. Um, it is a boff. I'm going to get off the stage in a minute and sit there, I guess. I just uh, wanted to say a few things by way of introduction, so I'm up here. Um, would anyone be willing to watch IRC for any questions that come up? Can, okay, thank you, Jonathan. Uh, okay, so what is Debian policy? Well, it's the document that defines the content, the, what is allowed to go into packages, the document that defines the technical content of packages, requirements for that content. You might say it's like a spec for all of Debian, or as much as we've managed to document. Um, it's also a repository of lessons learned, so things that we've learned not to do in developing Debian are written down there, and that's a useful thing to have for us and for others. Uh, what is it not? The key thing that it's not is it doesn't really deal with social processes, so we have this other document, the developer's reference, which is meant to contain social uh, uh, workflows and how to coordinate with each other. And so sometimes people file policy bugs asking for social stuff to go in, and usually we just reassign it to developer's reference. Uh, I thought I might, might be interested to know why I work on policy. Uh, in real life, I'm a philosophy PhD student, and so like my skills that I get from that are saying, stating things precisely, so I work on policy in the hope of applying that to Debian's benefit. Uh, so that's that. Um, how does it work? How, does, how do changes to policy happen? Well, there's an appendix to policy called the policy changes process. And it basically has four stages. So someone posts a bug saying, um, I think there's something wrong with this section, or I think this thing should be written down. And that's the discussion phase. And then at some point, someone comes up so the discussion comes to a consensus about what needs to happen, and that's called the proposal phase. So there's a proposal for what should be done. Uh, and once there's a proposal, the next thing is to write a patch to the manual documenting the proposal. And that's possibly the hardest stage. Like, often we know what we want to do, but writing it down can be tricky. And then the patch needs to be seconded by DDs. So we want uh, three people three DDs to sign off on a patch. So if the patch submitter was a DD, that counts as one, and then two seconds. If the patch was submitted by a non-DD, then we need three seconds. So seconding is the only thing you have to be a DD to do, or everything else in that process anyone can do. And you don't have to be a special kind of DD to second policy bugs. That's something that uh, anyone can do. Uh, I've, talking to people this week, I've discovered that some people thought it was like a a smaller group than that, so I wanted to mention that. Uh, and then the changes go in. What, what do the policy editors do? That's what I am, I'm one of the four policy editors. Uh, basically, three things. Uh, we maintain the package in the standard sense, so we triage the bugs, we fix FTBFS bugs, which do sometimes happen, uh, and uh, that, kind of, that kind of stuff, we write the change log. Uh, we guide the bugs through the process, kind of part of triaging. So we, uh, like, if it's not clear what should happen next with a bug, the policy editors try and, like, indicate that. And we judge when consensus has been established. So that's the thing, that's basically the reason we're DPL delegated, because that can be very contentious in some cases. Usually it's not. So that's the three things we do. Uh, one other thing to mention about how policy works is that it's intended to lag behind what's going on in Debian. So uh, changes to policy should never block doing other stuff, generally. Uh, there are exceptions where the only th you have to change policy first, but generally you should just do stuff if it's the right thing to do and write it down later. Uh, and changes to policy shouldn't make lots of packages buggy because they should already be considered buggy and that's why we're writing it in policy. So, uh, like, you know, if we've got a project consensus that we shouldn't do X, then all packages doing X are buggy and so if we write down in policy that you shouldn't do X, we didn't make anything buggy. That's the idea. 
Okay, let me talk about the past year since the last policy buff. Policy has been uploaded 10 times. Seven of those uploads were normative, as in they changed the requirements specified. The other three were like fixing packaging bugs, I think. Um, I would like the seven to be 12. I think it would be great if we were releasing policy about once a month. Uh, why don't we? Well, uh, we try to wait until there's about four substantive changes waiting to be released because otherwise like, we'd be sending these very short emails to Debian Dev Announce and expecting people to, to read them and that wouldn't be a good use of people's time. And the Lintium maintainers uh, have to respond to policy releases so we don't wanna make spurious ones. But if we, it would be great if we had enough changes that we could release once a month, that would be, that would be a, a goal. So that's, that's releases. Uh, we fixed all the issues relating to the transition to Sphinx and RST, I think. I don't think there are any more open bugs. The webmaster team are going to add some redirects. That hasn't happened yet, but we closed all the bugs against policy, I think. Uh, so that's pretty cool. There's been a lot of contributors over the past year. Like, there's been people who have come back after a while not working on policy and submitted useful patches. So Ian is someone who's done that. Uh, and there have been people like Simon McVitie who have been involved in a lot of discussions. And there have been a lot of people who I won't mention because there's so many of them who have just come in and made a first contribution to policy. So that's been great. Translations. Uh, Hideki Yamane and I are working on translations. Uh, and I think I know how that's going to work in terms of process. I think I've talked to enough people at DevConf to figure out how to do it. Uh, so it's just a case of basically getting the tech to work. And I think this is the first time someone's tried to translate something written in Sphinx, in Debian at least. So, you know, we don't, we're still figuring out how to do that. But I think it's only a matter of time before we can start translating, which I'm very excited about because there's these old translations of old versions of policy floating around on the internet. And, you know, if you speak that language, you might be tempted to refer to that instead of, uh, the current version of policy and then you might be uploading stuff that's buggy and uh, that's pretty bad. So I'm hoping we can get official translations up and running. Okay, that's everything I had, so I'm going to get off the stage. Uh, I thought people could ask questions about the process, we could uh, talk about suggestions for changes to the process or particular bugs, we could talk about how to attract contributors, and we could talk about translations, anything to do with policy. Ian, here is a mic. I just wanted to say that the translations is really cool for another reason. Um, if you are not a native English speaker and you're using one of Debian or one of our derivatives, uh, you might need to read that documentation to find out how to make your computer do what you want. Um, and the fact that that documentation may now be available, going to be available in your native language uh, and not be years or decades out of date, that's really cool. Yes, so I kind of gave a negative only reason, and so I appreciate that. Also, it's like, you know, we expect all contributors to be able to use English, but like, you can save people's time if they don't have to decipher something that's not in their native language. So for developers as well, it's great. Yeah. Hello, so I recently had a quite, quite trivial problem with the, with the policy, uh, a minor problem with the policy process, but it was annoying enough for me not to, to second um, uh, proposed change. In fact, the diff that I saw um, um, contained also a lot of layout diffs, and this made it very, very difficult for me to, to read what precisely uh, the diff and, and the contents was. So because it was just some, some trivial change in, uh, in, in, in line breaks and that made it quite, quite difficult for me to see right on the spot. I, I mean, I could have made a, a, a JIT checkout and a JIT, uh, JIT vertif, but I didn't do it. So it would probably much, much easier be for people when there would be a more, more readable diff of the proposed change. That's a great idea. I don't know how to implement it. Does anyone have any, any thoughts? Uh, can you generate a word diff that can be pasted into a bug email? Is that possible? So what you, what you could do is, I suppose, 
that you're having a JIT branch for the proposed changes. Mm. And then you can, uh, instead of doing a JIT diff, you can do a JIT W diff, I think, something like that. And ah. this gives you a word diff. Uh, or otherwise, you could just uh, uh, take care when you edit the document in your, in your feature branch uh, that you do not introduce any layout changes like right. uh, word, like line, line, line breaks or stuff like that. Right. Okay. Uh, so, there's normally a branch. If I write a patch, I always have it on a branch. I guess I, it might be useful to just reference the branch and maybe write in the readme saying like, please push a branch and reference it. Does that, does that seem sensible? Okay, I'm gonna put that in the readme, thank you. Uh, it might be worth having a small script that you could run on a mail you know, that maybe one of the policy editors would run. If, if somebody doesn't push it to a branch, you'd have a script that would feed the patch to git am on a little, on a detached head and produce the word diff and automatically email it to the list saying, oh, I automatically generated this thing. And then if that becomes a thing we end up doing a lot, then we can have a robot do it. Yeah, totally. You want to write it? <laughs> oh, I've written so many male robots. <laughs> yes, you have. Uh, yeah. Uh, I'll, I guess I'll investigate how hard that is. Thank you. That's great, because seconding, I guess I hadn't really realized that there was, the seconding was, had workflow issues, so that's really valuable feedback. Thank you. The main thing that we need ta volunteer time on, I guess, is writing patches, because, as I said, it's pretty, it's pretty uh, time intensive. So I write most of the patches, but like, kind of, it's kind of not meant to be that way, right? The uh, policy editors are meant to be reviewing patches more than writing them. Um, but that's just how it is. Um, uh, Sorry, can you take a microphone? Could you explain how does the translation work? Does it translate sentence by sentence or just they translate uh, by the paragraph? I mean. uh, it's going to be standard PO4A, which I think works by paragraph. Is that, does that, has anyone had any experience uh, translating? PO, okay, it's PO5, I think. Yeah, it's PO4A. So uh, Chinese translation would be great because you know, we have a lot of potential developers in China, I'm sure. Um, about translation, how mm. do we expect to keep track of um, the fact that the, the updates of the original English policy mm. into in other languages? Or maybe the fact that you have, like, uh, a translated policy that is almost up to date and you want to specify to the user, you can refer to it except maybe for this paragraph. Right. How do we expect to do that? Uh, as I understand it, the way PO4A works is it tracks whether a translation is up to date. And if it's not, the English text replaces the out of date translated text, uh, which is wonderful. And these unofficial translations can't do that. So that's why it's great to have an official translation. Do you have a list of issues that you need uh, help with somewhere, accessible, publicly? Yes, yes, we do. So last DevCon, uh, two of the policy editors, me and Russ, uh, did a, a, had a triage session or sessions, and we went through our entire list, and we basically divided it into two, well, three, but the third list is done now. Uh, things that we think ought to be uncontroversial, and are basically, in almost all cases, waiting for someone to write a patch, and things that it's not clear what should change, and so like, people can dig into them, but they should expect it to take longer. That is available if you clone the policy repo and check out a branch called triage. You'll find a file triage.txt, which has that list. Uh, that could go somewhere better if someone wants to move that. Um, but yes. 
So that's on salsa. Yeah. If you well, if you just type Deb, Deb check out Debian policy. So one could make issues out of it. GitLab issues. Uh, so that's that's something that actually came up just this week. Um, we the discussions that happen that lead to a policy change have to be archived because we don't like put all the reasoning for the change into policy. So the problem with salsa issues is that the archiving is a bit less robust than the BTS. So I think we probably prefer not to do that. But we could probably publish that triage list better. Does anyone have any thoughts where that could go? Debian Wiki? That sounds fine. Yeah? OK. So the bug system has a feature that allows you to have that triage view be the default view of the bugs. You mean user tags? It's very complicated. If um, there's, it involves, I think it involves user tags, and it also involves setting some other properties somewhere. The DevScripts package has done it. We've, we already have that um, for the stages of the process. So this question about whether a bug is easy is orthogonal to that, right? Can we do both at once? Uh, you can have multiple of these axes, and I think have everything classified by both. OK. We could, maybe you and I could talk about that. Because uh, you probably know it. Did well, I, I, I was going to do this for the DGIT package, and I thought this is far, far too hard. Um, but it might be worth it for policy. I did at least look at the relevant docs and go, oh my god. Right. If so you've already done the Well, we don't want to break what's there. But if we were able to add this information as well, then sure. I think possibly that's possible. Let's talk about that later. Thank you. These are some fantastic suggestions. I'm very grateful. I guess you're all just itching to write some patches. Uh, one thing that you might do is you might, I know it's a very small group here and probably not very representative, but if there are particular uh, kind of awkward bugs yes. that you want to. Well, OK, so there's time consuming and there's awkward. I mean, not that, I mean, we just closed this morning one of the most awkward that's been open for 10 years, so that was pretty great. Uh, awkward ones aren't occurring to me. Here's some really difficult but uncontroversial ones. Uh, documenting multi-arc. <laughs> right now, the only docs for multi-arc are the spec and the implementation, which, as I understand it, are not the same. Uh, because you know this, they, may, they realize that aspects of the spec should be changed, and so they implemented an improved version, uh, which is great. Uh, but right now, if you want to understand, I don't understand multi-arc. And if I wanted to, I'd have to read the spec, probably end up reading the code. Uh, kind of a drag. It would be great if policy said what multi-arc is and what the different values mean. Uh, we tried. Uh, Helmet's grown, had a go. Uh, but unfortunately, we got stuck. Uh, so if anyone else would like to make a fresh attempt at getting multi-arc in, that would be, I think, a, a huge contribution to Debian to have that written down in policy. Uh, second one, depackaged triggers are not in policy. Um, if you want to use one, if you think that a depackaged trigger is what you need, you have to start reading the man pages and probably end up reading the code. Uh, it's pretty tough. It would be great if that was just right there in policy for you to read and apply. There's the original text file, which is just like a plain text file spec. Um, I think one change was made after that was Is that written. triggers? The triggers, yeah. Right. Uh, and that, is I it? mean, that's in the deepakish dev package somewhere. Um, right. So you're not completely stuffed. Um, probably will, I mean, I certainly this should be in policy. Um, but I think the multi-arch thing is more important because the, the spec that's on the various, there's a spec on the wiki and it's the Quite Ubuntu indigestible. Wiki spec as well, yeah. There's and one on the Ubuntu wiki, which I think is the canonical. Uh, right, and neither of those describe canonical completely source. what was accidentally, what was, sorry, actually implemented. Right. Um, and um, 
this this situation is not very good. Yeah, it's it's pretty bad. Um, so you know, if you're interested in learning about these things and then writing down what you learned, please, please get involved. Basically, for these really tough bugs, uh, the policy editors themselves, like me, don't want to drive the bug because then we do nothing else, right? We wouldn't have triage and maintenance. So the idea is that uh, we would like uh, someone other than us to drive something like documenting multi-arc and then we'll be very eager to review patches uh, and discuss it. Uh, cool, we just have one comment from RSC. Yes. Uh, Gregor says, uh, SP Witten's blog posts are also very helpful. Um, check out the tag Debian policy and it's also syndicated on planet Debian, so if anyone's following or watching this video afterwards, uh, look that up, it's really good. Uh, thanks. Yes, I'm, we have a script that's quite old, uh, but it still works fine, that extracts user tag information, basically, uh, from the BTS. It ha gives you three lists, uh, things that are awaiting a patch, things that are awaiting a second, and things that are merged for the next release, and I blog that about once a month. That was a suggestion at last, the last one, last year. Uh, other hard things, so multi-arc, the package triggers. Uh, let's see. There are some control fields that aren't written down. So I learned this week that there's a tags field that connects to dev tags, uh, and that's not in policy. So, you know, if I came across a source package with that field, I wouldn't know what it meant. Uh, so if you, if you come across something like that, then consider writing a patch. If you spent time figuring out what the field may, means and when it's meant to be used, share it. Well, we don't have to continue if there aren't any more questions. Thank you for your interest. Um, please feel free to speak to me if there's an open bug you'd like to, to start working on. Thank you. And thank you, video team. <laughs>